Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Bridget is a, a better looking speaker to come up here, but she just wanted to keep her voice for later on. So, you're stuck with me, unfortunately. So, we were given the title, I know CPR, I don't need to practice. I think it's going to be hopefully self-explanatory at the end of the session. Uh, we came up with a little bit of research. We've done a few different projects. In the last two respond conferences, we conducted some research that most of you hopefully have participated in, and we'll go through some of the details. We're going to focus on last year's conference. We did some research also as some of the Wicklow CFR training, uh, but we're going to go through a few bits and pieces just in last year mainly. So, Professor Tom Quinn's here. Um, why do we do research? I know he's a big favourite of using this hashtag. And Professor Galvin has just talked about research. There's different, many different types of research. We're going to be talking about one concept we did, but Professor Galvin has just talked about the reasons why he does different research that's going to tell about why people have passed away, the etiology, why we're going to use certain things. As he said, long QT syndrome is one aspect that if we're told it had an cardiac arrest, why we may not use epinephrine. Uh, Twitter hashtag, and Andy down here is taking care of it for the CFR Ireland. Um, and I'd be a big user of Twitter, and Twitter is a good old concept. It's good. There's phone movement. Always try and use it, but always look at the concept behind it and research, and don't just believe the message that you see. There's Respond last year that we did. Evidence-based medicine is a lot of what we're doing, uh, and hopefully we're going to look at try and see what happens. So, chain of survival. Some of this is fairly easy, no normal concept. Uh, and I had a recent call, unfortunately, that some of our colleagues out of the control, the National Emergency Operations Centre, had to deal with a call. Uh, one of their colleagues, mother, uh, had a cardiac arrest only recently. And within the room here, then we had the ambulance service responded. They were in close proximity. Uh, Dr. Andy responded. There was a Docky community first responder responded. Dr. Tomas Barry, who's here as well, he responded. We had a huge amount of people, and the lady survived. Good old, con good old result out of it. Uh, and that's the reason we're all here and we're all trying to do better. But actually, the person who did the CPR first was who? It was the son, one of our, our non-clinical members of the ambulance service. So it's all about the CPR starting first. So high quality CPR, I know that Paul Trainer is going to be up next and he's going to be talking upon that uh, and he's going to look at the high quality. The OCAR, Siobhan Masterson and Maya have been very good to Bridget and I and helped us in different ways and we always look at the out of hospital cardiac arrest register for different information. 66% of these are at home from the latest, the 2014 register, the results that came out. Uh, bystander CPR recorded 71% of them. 66%, uh, 6.6% is now the survival rate, which is an increase. And of those, 6.6% the survival, 42% had defibrillation before the ambulance arrived. So again, community first responders is a big area that we're needing. Now then, I'm going to go through a few little concepts uh, of high quality CPR, but in the meantime, I'm going to ask Andy and Keith and Brian to come up on the stage and have a slightly different issue to start. So, as some people know, my passion is cycling as well. I have a few different passions. So, I have three bicycle tyres here. Uh, I'm going to ask the three lads, and I've talked to them already about how to pump up wheels. So, it's again, there's different concepts to do it. So, what I'm looking for is the tyre to be pumped up to 100 psi. There you go, lads. So, in line with actual CPR, what are we looking for? There's actually five concepts for high quality CPR, which is hand position. Lads are all different hand positions they're picking, but we'll be trained them in certain techniques. Compression depth, depends on the pump that they're using, and some of them have different pumps, but we're looking actually in CPR for a depth of no, more than five centimeters, but no more than six centimeters. Compression rate of 100 per minute, but I'm not quite sure that the lads are getting that at the moment, or whether <laughs> we need to speed up or slow down. But well, that's a very important aspect. We need at least 100. And the latest guidelines from the ERC and the AHA and ILCOR came out last year and saying that it had to be 100, no more than 120. Recoil, are they fully coming back up with the pumps at each time? Because we want to come off the chest. We don't want to actually bounce on the chest, but we want to make sure the chest fully expands and that we're getting proper compressions. One of the other key aspects, fourth key aspect of uh, good CPR. 
minimize interruptions. I think they're having their breaks at times, but <laughs> we don't want them texting or, you know, unfortunately I've stopped Andy tweeting for the conference, but we're going to actually minimize interruptions and good high quality CPR is, is non-stop CPR. No more than 10 seconds for your respirations. So, you all happy lads? How do we know we got there? Are we sure they all got 100? Who reckons who, who got who, who reckons Brian here on the left got a hundred? PSI? <laughs> Andy in the middle? Yeah, there's more yeses. And then Keith down on the right? God, there's very definitive, no. Anyway, I'm not gonna start checking them, but I'm gonna come back and I'll talk about the reasons. The three lads have three different pumps, but I'll I'll kind of list, list them in a little while. Thanks. <laughs> Hopefully it'll all come. Obvious what I was at now in a sec. So instead of boring us all to death and trying to talk about that, what you all know about, we'll go into the mannequin study that we took part, we, we conducted last year. Uh, Bridget Sinnott, uh, obviously, and Neve Cummins, our UL, is involved. And then we also did have Steve O'Flaherty came up last year and kindly helped us out. So that's the equipment used. We got, did get a lend off uh, true CPR device. There was no. Um, Onus, uh, no money, nothing at all, and we have no uh, proprietary requirements from true CPR. So the study design, we used uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation for four minutes that every member had to partake in. The resuscitation torso, a life pack CR plus trainer, which gave the time frame. We silenced the metronome, we, we had the screen covered over. Participants, we had 35 participants of who were responders. Now that is as perfect guidelines, which was from CFR, Occupational First Aid and EFR was the responder group. And then the practitioner group was EMT, paramedic, advanced paramedic, and we also included doctors and nurses as well as the responder level. So there was 35 in the responder and 32 in the practitioner level, which was fairly even. So who do you think better did better? <laughs> we'll see. So the depth, we had a target depth of 38% the responder group got. The race. The mean compression rate, so the average rate when we took out over, over the 35 personnel, we had a mean compression rate of 114. In the target zone, only 60% of the time they were between the 100 and 120 rate. Recoil, a mean of 83%. So again, they weren't coming off the chest all the time, but 83% is a good figure. And then good compression, the machine actually did all the data for us. So what good compressions was, was a figure where they looked at, was the person at the right speed, at the right depth, and no pushing on the chest that they had complete recoil. That was only a mean of 18%, which was very low. So good compressions was only 18% of the time. The range was between zero and 81. So someone did achieve 81% uh, during the actual test. So that was a very high good compression ratio. Practitioners, we had 32. So 41% was the average depth. The mean rate was 119, slightly higher, but just below the 120. Target was 55% in the, in, the, in the right zone. Their mean compression, their recoil was 85, slightly higher, but still around the same. And the good compression rate was up at 21% this time. Their range was lower, so 71% was the highest. One person did get none, no good compressions at any stage. So what does that tell us? We looked at chest compression fraction. So if you look at the latest guidelines, they're pushing about chest compression fraction, which is a fancy word of hands off time. We want to keep our hands on the chest. So the responder group had a, an event compression of 65%, which the latest VET guidelines are looking for a minimum, of, or the, the LCOR guidelines are looking for a minimum of 65%. So even last year, you were ahead of the curve and attaining the level that's needed. The range was between 50 and 70%. The longest pause, because it also me it measured the time without CPR, was 24 seconds was the longest pause between any start of compressions at one stage during the test. Uh, the pause range then between 60 and 49 seconds. Uh, we had compressions during charge phase. That is something that's in. We didn't ask people whether or not they were doing it, but none of the responders actually did CPR during compression, during the, the charging phase of the defibrillator. Group two were responder, the practitioners. 65% again, 50 to 74 equivalent, longest pause slightly less, the range was the same, but there was 13% actually did compressions during the charge phase, which is something that practitioners are expected. We would have expected that figure to be higher, that people would have actually done compressions during the charge phase, so that's more a practitioner aspect. 
So, conclusions, what are we going to come up with? Many participants were in the correct rate range for the rate depth and re recoil of compression, so the CPR is going well. Good compression rates were low though, and that's, that's the disappointing aspect, so uh, sometimes when you do research, you know, be careful what you look for and what you might find. So the compressions, good compressions were not good and that needs to be worked at. Uh, and why are we looking at that? Because as I said, that 6.6% survival rate is, is a great figure, it's jumped up from what it was, but we needed to go higher. Feedback devices would help in training, and that's what I was using with the, the CPU, with the pumping of the wheels there. So only one person, well, two of them had feedback devices. Do you know what feedback devices are on the pumps? What? Pressure gauges, yeah. So poor Keith was at a distinct disadvantage when he had no pressure gauge, so it was a case of what he felt was right. Andy had a gauge that was sitting in front of him that he could see at a, at a good distance, and Brian here that had it right on the actual stock of the pump, which wasn't necessarily advantageous. But feedback devices would help in training. And good quality CPR is essentially meaningful to improvements in the outcome of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients. One of our take-home messages and our big take-home messages by Vince Lombardi is uh, the Super Bowl trophy is named after him. But he made that quote, and I think it's very applicable in this case. If you want to find out more information, there's the old Twitter handles of the three different people involved in the project. Some better looking people under me. There's another take home message for you. <laughs> there are questions later, hopefully to Professor Galvin, to Paul and to John. I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much.